Hi everyone, uh, my name is Ed, and this is my first crack at uh, recording a sermon. Um, most preachers, uh, when they prepare a sermon, they try to prepare a small, bite-sized lunch for you. Um, uh, something that would, uh, you know, be easily absorbed. And uh, so they talk about a doctrine, a subject, or a few key verses, and then they unpack that. Um, but uh, I believe that uh, as a preacher, we also have a responsibility to try and teach or paint a bigger picture for people, uh, like a mural um, uh, that shows how things fit together. So, um, and the purpose of that is to expand the believer's ability to understand and receive direction uh, in the Christian life. Um, so uh, today that's what I'm going to do. So if uh, it's not really about uh, the, 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 the individual doctrines that I'm going to talk about, it's more about how things fit together to give us a better understanding or a bigger picture of the Christian life. Okay, so the title of my sermon is um, Faith in, in the Kingdom of God. Um, so uh, I'll start the sermon in Hebrews chapter 11. Okay, the whole, uh, it's a, it starts, the first three verses is a biblical definition of faith. And then the whole rest of the chapter is a display of the evidence um, or the proof of faith of the patriarchs of the Old Testament. Okay, and it's a, and it's a true testimony by the Holy Spirit of their actions and life's work. Okay even in the face of opposition. There's always going to be opposition. If you're a true believer and you're walking the walk and not only talking the talk, then you're going to face opposition in this world. And uh, so this is, so that's what that chapter is about. And the first three verses is a biblical definition of faith. So let's, let's read that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, 2. And I'll just do a quick mention of three. So, verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by faith the elders obtained a good testimony. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. So, in these three verses, uh, in the first verse twice, it says, Faith is, faith is. In the second verse, it says by faith. And in the third verse, it says through faith. All right. So there's a definite difference on the approach to faith in these three verses. So the first one says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. So a substance is a real thing. All right. In, in this verse and in context, the real thing is a hidden reality because it's not seen, all right? Um, now, faith is the substance of things hoped for. What are the things that we all hope for, right? Um, the things we hope for, we hope for a better world to live in, a better life, right? A life that's dominated by peace, without corruption, without fear, without strife, a loving family, a loving community, and a loving nation where everyone working together in harmony for the for everyone's well-being you know what that hope is that hope is the reality within the kingdom of God within the kingdom of heaven all right so uh, faith is the substance of things is the reality of the things we hope for which is the kingdom of heaven okay verse in the second part of the first verse it says uh, faith is the evidence of things not seen and evidence is proof in a trial when they display evidence it's evidence of the truth so it's proof of truth right and the things not seen is the life that we hope for in heaven okay uh, verse 2 says for by faith the elders obtained a good testimony and remember what I said when I first started here that the whole of chapter 11 is a display of the evidence 
of the faith of the patriarchs in the Old Testament, right? It's uh, the Holy Spirit's uh, testimony or testifying that about the life and the actions of these patriarchs, even in the face of opposition. So by faith, we obtain a good testimony. So when we go to the judgment seat of Christ, we obtain that testimony. And verse 3 says, through faith, we understand. Through faith means by the power of faith. By the power of faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Here the author is saying that the word of God has all power. All power and authority rests within the power, within the word of God. And to finish the verse, it says, So that things which are seen were not made of the things which do appear. Again, the invisible is, is being presented. The hidden reality of a spiritual world, of a spiritual kingdom. So we, uh, th that was my opener for, to, 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 uh, to break into the sermon. And uh, really the sermon is about the kingdom of God. And uh, so I want to, I just want to talk about for a few minutes, what is a kingdom? Because I believe uh, that we in North America have lost a great deal of the understanding of the realities of living in a kingdom. All right. Back in Jesus' day, everybody lived in it all the time. So they, they had a really strong re uh, grip on what it was like. But we've lost that. A kingdom is a form of government. It's not a democracy, and it's not a religion, all right? It is the area where a king exercises his authority and rules and reigns um, over his subjects. This is referred to as a dominion. A king is a sovereign ruler, um, a dictator, a monarch. A monarch is one, means one with all authority and power, just one, one ruler. The king wears a crown, which is a symbol of his sovereignty and authority over everyone and everything. Kingdom hierarchy is established by appointing nobles to rule over smaller areas of the land, such as agricultural farmland or other cities that are not in the capital or, uh, you know, uh, po uh, cities that are ports. Or trade routes so they would have assigned a noble over those to rule over them to make sure that everything goes smoothly and that the king's will is done there so nobles are loyal citizens who swear allegiance to the will and purposes of the king for anyone to challenge the authority of the nobles or the king constitutes treason and was in danger of immediate death penalty without a trial or any legal investigation, okay? Only nobles were entitled to a trial. Kingdoms were expanded by conquering neighboring kingdoms and then colonized. Um, a loyal noble uh, subject and a citizen would be sent to rule over or govern as an ambassador uh, to change the culture of the conquered lands to adhere to kingdom laws and customs. The king was responsible for infrastructure and government leadership, and the noble answered only to the king. Nobility is a kingdom reward for ambassadors who display loyalty and service to the king and his kingdom. In the New Testament, every believer is called to be an ambassador for Christ in his kingdom to develop noble character here on earth while we're here so on uh I, I, this is a good time to talk about the power of words what what the power of a word lies within the action being described by the meaning of the word so let me repeat that the power of a word lies within the action the, uh, described by the meaning of the word. It has nothing to do with saying the word or the word itself. It's about the action that the word is describing. That's where the power lies. That's what, and um, so now let's let's uh, so no, noble 
and nobility, the power of the word of noble, is in being a righteous servant of the king. Yeah, loyal. Um, let's, let's move on to the kingdom of God, uh, a few scriptures that describe it. In Luke 17, 20 and 21, um, Jesus, Jesus, when Jesus was demanded of the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come, he answered them and said, The kingdom of God comes not with observation, neither shall they say, Look here or look there. Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. So God's kingdom here is represented as invisible, right? It comes not with observation. It's invisible. You can't see it. It's an inner reality within you. It's in your heart. It's a choice that we make, right? Remember that when we spoke about faith, faith is the evidence of things not seen. So evidence is proof of the things not seen. It's inside of us. The Apostle Paul struggled with this and tried to explain it to us in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 16 to uh, 5, 1. And uh, he talked about, uh, I'll just read it for you and, and we'll unpack it a little bit. Verse 16, Therefore we do not lose heart, even though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, he's talking about our mortal bodies, is dissolved or dies, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands, He's talking about our heavenly bodies, eternal in the heavens. So from these four verses, we get three realities about the kingdom principles. Okay, there's an outward, there's an inward. There's a seen, there's an unseen. There's a temporary, and there's an eternal. And if we put them in the order that they come out in these four passages, it says, that the outward is here in the world, right, is earthly. It's outward, is seen, and it's temporary. But uh, the uh, spiritual reality is inward, it's unseen, and it's eternal, all right? It's a real substance. Uh, spiritual reality is inward and unseen and eternal. So we can make three statements from that, all right? First, by faith we see the kingdom of God. The second statement, by conversion we enter the kingdom of heaven. And the third statement, by humbling ourselves in submission we receive rewards. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the gospel of the kingdom of, of God. Um, Matthew chapter 5 verse 3. That's not there. Okay, Jesus lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are the poor, are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God. All right, so here we can replace poor in spirit by compassionate. All right, Jesus said, Blessed are the compassionate, for yours is the kingdom of God. So he's talking about poor in spirit as being Seeing a need and meeting a need. If you see the poor and he's hungry, give him something to eat. If they're cold, give them a coat. It's all of us working together for the well-being of everyone, right? The kingdom of heaven. Well, that's what it's supposed to be like. Okay, so religion does not save anyone, all right? Uh, being born again saves us, okay? Uh, repent and turn back. To a spiritual kingdom, the kingdom of God, is a relationship with the king. Jesus is calling us to repent of our rebellion against his will, his authority, his government. Um, so repent and follow Jesus by faith, hearing his voice. His voice is the word of God. And practice what he teaches in order to reintroduce us as law-abiding citizens into the culture of his kingdom. <clears throat> in Luke 
chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus said unto them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, for therefore am I sent. You see that Jesus preached the kingdom of God. He said, I must preach the kingdom of God, for therefore am I sent. He would, the Father sent him just for that. So the kingdom of heaven is the place where God lives, where the king rules, where the king rules from. Uh, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are used interchangeably within the gospel because God is sovereign over both. His dominion is over all that exists. Heaven is where God is, and our ideal goal is to be nearer to him. Therefore, our goal is to be in heaven. In the Lord's Prayer, we say, Our Father, who is in heaven, do you see that heaven is where God is? You might say, his castle is in heaven. Heaven is the place where his throne is located. <clears throat> Earth is an expansion to God's kingdom. We could call it a colony. And at the fall of mankind in Genesis, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they broke the only law that existed in the Garden of Eden by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And it was an act of rebellion. They declared independence from God's kingdom. They, in effect, were saying, we don't need you anymore, thereby committing treason against the king. And thus, sin entered into us and changed our relationship with the king. We became outlaws in his kingdom. Mankind became outlaws by our re rebellious actions. God then said from the... From the sweat of your brow, you will provide for yourselves from now on. God, by these words, granted us independence from his kingdom in the form of free choice. So, uh, understanding uh, the two aspects of the kingdom of God. So, um, I took this from an excerpt in the Believer's Commentary on page 1209, if anyone's interested in looking that up. And reading about it, I didn't, I didn't take the whole thing. I just kind of uh, took the basic message out of it. So, um, first of all, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven. Okay, the kingdom of heaven would be is a circle within a circle. So the small circle on the inside would be the kingdom of heaven, and the big circle on the outside would be the kingdom of God. So it's a circle within a circle. And that, exp that will explain what the kingdom of the difference between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven and why they are used interchangeably. So the kingdom of heaven is used 32 times in the gospel of Matthew, but the kingdom of God is mostly used in all other gospels. They are interchangeable with different subtle nuances that should be understood between the two. So first, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is defined as the sphere in which God's rule is acknowledged, okay? So in heaven, all who are there willingly follow the will of God. They acknowledge him as king and sovereign Lord. When, wherever people willingly submit to the rule of God, there the, hev the kingdom of heaven exists, okay? That's considered to be the inner aspect, the inner circle, the small one. Okay, on earth, we can enter the kingdom of heaven by willingly following the will of God. We acknowledge him as king and sovereign Lord. And so, whether you're on earth or you're in heaven, you can still be within the kingdom of heaven. You can still enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so, the kingdom of God now, the bigger circle. Uh, the kingdom of God includes the kingdom of heaven, but also has an outer aspect to it that includes those that do not acknowledge God's sovereignty over the universe. It includes rebels. We should all know that the leader of the, the, Satan is the leader of the rebels, okay? And that's considered to be the kingdom of God, which is the outer aspect. So it includes true believers, and, but it also includes people who don't believe. There are two aspects to the kingdom of God. In its broadest sense, it includes all who profess to acknowledge God as supreme ruler, but in its narrowest sense or aspect, it includes only those who have been genuinely converted 
In reality, not all who profess Jesus as Lord are truly converted or born again. In John chapter 3, verse 3, Jesus said, Most assuredly, I say unto you, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So in this verse, we, we see that if, you, if you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Never mind, enter the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand? You can't even see it because of your denial. In Matthew chapter 18, verse 3 and 4, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it says here, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So by conversion, we enter the kingdom of heaven. All right. And verse 4 tells us how. Verse 4, the words converted as little children emphasizes a personal willing submission to the will of God, to acknowledge God's dominion. <clears throat> Uh, the most revealing of uh, the parables is the parable of the wheat and the tares because it teaches us that it is not our job to sort the true from the false Christians. The angels of God will do that, but our job is to remain loyal to the words of Jesus, our King, by declaring his sovereignty and practicing his teaching and will for our lives. Childlike submission of ourselves to, for our regeneration as legal citizens in his kingdom, um, we, we are responsible for our own individual behavior and responses. We cannot make choices for others. All we can do is influence. We influence others by sharing the truth with them. They must choose their own paths. The kingdom of God is not the church. It's bigger. The church exists within the kingdom and is within the inner circle. At present, the people who, who are in the kingdom in its true inner reality are also in the church. The church began at Pentecost and ends at the marriage supper of the Lamb. But, uh, but the kingdom began when Jesus started his ministry and never ends. The kingdom never ends. So that's the end of what I took from uh, the Believer's Commentary. Um, and now I'd like to move on to uh, some of the things that I think about uh, the Kingdom of, of Heaven and God. At the fall of mankind in Genesis, we rebelled against God and His rule, uh, declaring independence from His Kingdom government. Uh, and God uh, is calling us back to Him through faith in Jesus. We must willingly choose to follow him to reverse our individual declaration of independence that separates us from God. We must be born again. Repent of our sinful declaration of independence and submit and follow Jesus, our true Lord and King, as his loyal subjects. When we are born again, we are adopted into the family of God and receive for an inheritance salvation. Um, into the kingdom okay as legal citizens no longer outlaws um, our true citizenship is not on earth but in the kingdom of god then here on earth we become ambassadors for his kingdom preaching the gospel of the kingdom of god ambassadors represent the country or kingdom they are citizens in and their actions and words matter ambassadors should reflect the culture and values of their kingdoms. God's kingdom is exemplified by peace, forgiveness, grace, righteousness, and justice. God is love, and his citizens must demonstrate peacemaking, loving righteousness, truth, practicing truth, and justice. This culture is defined as nobility, right? 
That's the culture. Just said that's the real description of nobility. So it's the meaning of the word. Okay, if we read, believe, and desire to practice the meaning of the words within the Bible, Jesus sends His Holy Spirit to indwell a believer as the King's seal in our adoption and acceptance as legal citizens into His kingdom. The Holy Spirit then provides the believer with the power to overcome the world and his own sinful nature. By daily guiding and nurturing us, the Holy Spirit reminds us of the teachings we received by reading the Bible, the Word of God. So, when the circumstances of life demand we respond to worldly events and tempt us to sin, the Holy Spirit reminds us of the words of God we have read. If we're not reading our Bibles, how can the Holy Spirit remind us of what we've read? So therein exists the relationship with our King and Lord. We must read the Word of God. The Word of God is living, and it's true. It's inerrant. There's no mistakes in it. Repent and become a doer of the means of the words of God. Therein lies all the power. In the word of God so being born again is not literal okay it is symbolic Jesus is calling return to your father who created you and re-enter God's revealed kingdom that exists within your heart by inspiration of the Holy Spirit through one mediator Jesus Christ our Lord and our King truly converted born-again believers are saved by the forgiving grace of the Father through faith in the Son, responding to the guidance of the indwelling Holy Spirit, submitting willingly to Jesus, our sovereign King, thereby, thereby being adopted as children into an inheritance, everlasting life, as legal citizens in the kingdom of God. As legal citizens, we then obtain the privilege to serve here on earth and merit kingdom rewards. Rewards must be earned through noble actions in the face of opposition, the whole point of Hebrews chapter 11. Jesus said, I will give you the Holy Spirit who will dwell within you. But Jesus also said, I will come to you and my Father will come to you and we will make our abode in you. You see plainly that the Trinity will take up residence in the heart of each of us as we mature as Christians, exercising and developing the image of God's character within ourselves, also known as Christ-likeness. The worldly people and the outward aspect of professing Christianity can even see, can't even see God's kingdom because of their own denial their own rebellious nature against the reality, the spiritual reality that God is in control. I'd like to, I'd like to pray. Dear God in heaven, we are so grateful for your word. We pray that it would be written upon our hearts and that you would bless us with more understanding, more understanding with a bigger picture to see how our lives fit in to your will and your purposes we pray that you would bless each of us with more faith please increase our faith the substance of faith is the realities of a life that exists within the kingdom of heaven the things we hope for are a better world a better place to live in peace with our families with our community as a nation where mutual respect is the norm and love and caring for each other is the priority for everyone where the government is noble righteous and fair Jesus we pledge our allegiance to you as King and Lord we thank you Lord Jesus for teaching us the difference between salvation and rewards and pray for the inner strength to press towards the mark of nobility in your kingdom. Even so, we pray, Lord Jesus, come quickly. 
Amen. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a great day.